Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. So, yes, my name's Nicholas. I'm a freelance Python developer from the UK. Um, and this is an introductory talk, uh, really, about AsyncIO uh, through the medium of distributed hash tables. Um, so AsyncIO, as I'm sure you all know, arrived in Python 3.4. Um, and my only expectation of you is that you know a little bit of Python. Um, so what we'll do is we'll explore some of the core concepts uh, of AsyncIO, and I'll tell you the story of how I used AsyncIO to create a, a fun little personal project, which was to build a distributed hash table, which uh, Holger very uh, usefully referenced in his uh, keynote this morning, which is perhaps why there's rather a lot of you in this room. Um, this isn't an exhaustive uh, exposition of AsyncIO. There's an awful lot I've had to leave out, and it simplifies a lot as well. Uh, but my aim is to arm you with just enough information so that you can continue exploring the module and the concepts found therein afterwards. Um, it's also a personal pedagogical exercise. If I can explain AsyncIO in a simple sort of a way, it's, uh, it demonstrates my own clarity of thought about AsyncIO and understanding about AsyncIO. Um, as you can hear, I'm talking very quickly because I have rather a lot of information uh, to, to, to give to you. So yes, uh, perhaps like Eric Gumby, your brain will hurt by the end of this talk. So uh, the first thing that needs to be answered is what does AsyncIO do? Well, the Python documents are very clear about this. They state that this module provides infrastructure for writing single-threaded concurrent code using coroutines, multiplexing IO access over sockets and other resources, running network clients and servers and other related primitives got all that? I've actually got that written down. I didn't do that from memory. Um, now, while I understand all the terminology uh, in, in, from the documentation, it doesn't give me a sense or a feel of, of how I might use, use this module. Um, and such documentation uh, can make the module appear a little bit intimidating and, and sort of the realm of esoteric leet uber hackers like Trinity, who's so leet she talks in courier fixed width. Um, see if you can figure out what Neo talks in. Anyway, what does AsyncIO do? Well, uh, we can do a lot better than that. We can keep the answer simple, stupid. Uh, what does AsyncIO do? As Trinity says, it lets you write code that concurrently handles asynchronous network-based IO. Um, so let's be clear about what I mean by those terms. So concurrency is when several things appear to happen at once. Um, asynchronous literally means not synchronized. There's no way to tell when something may happen. Uh, the network, of course, as you know, is a medium for communicating with, with another device, usually via the internet. And I.O. is, as I'm sure you all know, uh, input-output, uh, when a program communicates with the outside world. So, the problem clearly stated is that messages arrive and depart via the network at unpredictable times, and AsyncIO lets you deal with such interactions simultaneously. So given this simple purpose, I want to place AsyncIO into a practical context. Um, so let's talk about distributed hash tables. So again, let's start with the obvious question, what is a distributed hash table? Well, I'm assuming you know what a hash table is, because it's more or less the same thing as a dict in Python. We are at Europe Python after all, and I think it's reasonable that I can expect you to all understand what a dict is. It's a simple key value data store. Um, uh, a distributed hash table is distributed because the whole is built from several independent yet related parts. So it's a little bit like this abstract encyclopedia. The, the whole encyclopedia is made up of volumes that are independent yet related to each other. Um, and in our case, uh, the distributed hash table is a structure that consists of many independent nodes that, uh, that collaborate with each other over the network. Uh, DHT is also decentralized, uh, so no node is more important than, than any of the others. So there are no client-server relationship in the DHT. Uh, it's a loose peer-to-peer -peer network of, of nodes. Um, so a distributed hash table, a DHT, is a peer-to-peer key-value data store. Why would I want to implement one of these? Well, it's a really interesting programming problem with fascinating properties. As I mentioned, there's no single point of failure. Um, the DHT algorithm that I use, which is called Kademlia, um, efficiently scales to a huge number of nodes. Uh, it has good handling of fluid uh, network membership as, as nodes leave and join the network. Um, it's a solid foundation for more complex services, such as the ones that, that Holger referenced uh, this morning. Um, it's tested in the real world, so BitTorrent uses the Kademlia algorithm. FreeNet does as well. Um, and 
obviously, if you're, if you're like Holger, it's an example of decentralized platforms, uh, which are fascinating on more than just a technical level, on a political level as well, perhaps. So guess what? Distributed hash table nodes uh, have to concurrently handle lots of asynchronous network-based I.O., which is the sweet spot for async I.O. So we have a context. Um, so how does async I.O., or how do I use async I.O. to make all this work? So uh, let's introduce some core concepts, the first one being the event loop. Um, and quite simply, this is some code that just keeps looping. And each iteration of the loop basically does two things. First thing is that it polls for I.O. events uh, that occurred during the time it took to complete the previous iteration of the loop. Um, and the other thing that it does is that it, it runs any callbacks that, uh, that need to be run during this current iteration of the loop. Um, the loop also carries out various housekeeping uh, needed for callbacks that have yet to be executed, but that's, that's something that we can ignore. Um, so it's important, again, this is sort of an introductory talk, uh, to define what polling and callbacks are. So, polling is discovering the status of something external to the program. Um, and in async I.O., uh, this is network-related I.O. events. And a callback is some code that's to be executed when some event has occurred that's been detected via polling. And uh, this metaphor, obviously the kids are polling. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And, and the mother is saying, I'll let you know when we get there. And this creates a sort of a callback in that she is promising to do something when some condition is met, i.e. they get to the end of their journey and they get to grandma's house. So it's important to note that polling takes place once during each iteration of the loop. I.O. events... Are discovered by poll IO events discovered by polling determine which callbacks to execute during the current iteration of the loop. Um, all pending callbacks are executed one after the other, um, as it says so in Pepsi 15. Um, and the loop can't continue while this is happening, it is blocked. So the next iteration cannot start until all the sequentially executed callbacks finish in some sense. So you're probably asking, uh, there's something wrong here. This doesn't sound very concurrent. Well, unfortunately, concurrency is a hard problem, and there's actually more than one way to do it. So it's worth looking, uh, worth taking some time to examine why async I/O works in, in the way that it does. So in the traditional threading model, uh, several problems can happen. Task A reads a record. Task B reads a record. Both A and B change the retrieved data in different ways. Task B writes its changes. Then task A writes its changes. What's the problem here? Well, task A has overwritten uh, the record containing task B's changes. So we have loss of data, which is something that we want to avoid. So why not wait until uh, one task is finished uh, before uh, continuing? So first do A, then B, followed by C, and so on. Um, this is easy to understand and sort of deterministic, but uh, what happens if A needs to wait for something, such as uh, a call to another machine on the network? Um, well, the program has to wait until A's network call completes, um, and in that situation, uh, we can't get on with other stuff because we're still hanging around for A. So given the situation in this slide, the program is described as blocked, and this is unacceptable if we're if writing code that needs to react quickly um, to network-based events, which is precisely the sort of program that async has been, has been designed to help with. And so you're probably asking yourself, well, why not just get on with tasks B and C while we wait for uh, the result from the network call for A? Uh, well, if you're thinking that, then actually uh, you've uh, you've described quite succinctly uh, what async I.O. does. So, welcome to the most important slide of the talk. I hope you're all paying attention. <laughs> so, async I.O. is event-driven, uh, and this means that network-based I.O. is non-blocking. Um, so, how does this work? Well, the program does not wait for a reply from network calls before continuing. Programmers, us, define callbacks to be run when the result of the network call is known. And in the meantime, the program continues to poll for and respond to other network-related I.O. events. Um, callbacks execute during the iteration of the event loop immediately after the expected network I.O. event is detected. Confused? Well, you shouldn't be, because actually this is how we as humans think about uh, concurrency. So in the real world, we make plans all the time. 
Uh, the washing machine finishes is an expected event. And hang the clothes out to dry is a callback for when this expected event happens. So how hard can this be, says the stock photo dude with the washing basket. Um, also, uh, we multitask in the same way that a sync IO does. Um, we skip between the things we need to do while we wait for other things to happen. We know we will have time to squeeze the orange juice uh, while the toast and the eggs are cooking, while we make breakfast. We don't just stick some fridge in the microwave put it on for five minutes and then watch it. Well, I don't. You probably get on with other things. This is exactly the sort of thing that I'm talking about. We multitask. There's only one of us. There's only one async IO event loop, and it's, it's, uh, this is how we react to the world around us. The Microsoft, uh, the Microsoft, the microwave. <sighs> it was a long night last night. Um, the microwave goes ping, and that is the expected event, and then I take the porridge out and eat it, so on and so forth. Okay. So async IO avoids potentially confusing and complicated threaded concurrency while retaining the benefits of strictly sequential code. Thank you. Um, and this is the fundamental advantage of async IO. Uh, we plan ahead for expected events by defining callbacks to be called when such events eventually occur. And in the meantime, we sequentially handle the callbacks related to other events that may have happened in the intervening time. So questions you're probably asking yourself are, how are asynchronous concurrent tasks created? How do such tasks pause while waiting for non-blocking network-based I.O.? And how are callbacks defined to handle the eventual results? Um, to answer these questions, you need to understand coroutines, futures, and tasks. So I'm going to attempt to explain coroutines in about three slides. <laughs> and a coroutine essentially is an object representing an, in, representing an activity that eventually completes. Um, or it's a decorated function that returns such an object. And the important thing to know about coroutines are that they may be suspended using the yield from syntax. And uh, when uh, a coroutine is suspended, this allows the event loop to get on with the other things. Okay? Coroutines are sorts of generators, so they lazily generate results. So calling a coroutine doesn't actually start its execution. Um, they yield from other objects, and uh, when the yielded from object has a result, the coroutine continues from the yield from statement that suspended it, uh, and this is called re-entry. And at the end of the chain of, of yield from is an object that returns a result or raises an exception, rather than yielding from some other coroutine. So this, oh dear, look at that. I think you can see it all. Yeah, that's just Chrome being a bit daft. OK, so this uh, is a decorated coroutine method that handles an incoming HTTP request as part of my DHT. Um, upstream, something is yielding from the coroutine created by this function in order to do something with the response that it generates. Um, and this block of code will pause by yielding from the coroutine created by the payload.read um, call, uh, which is a method that reads the raw data posted as part of the request. You can see that just after the try. Okay. Um, when all that data has arrived, the code pauses again while waiting for the code routine created by the self.process data method um, itself, uh, waiting on other things such as perhaps a call to the database. Um, and when the task encapsulated by this code routine is complete, i.e., it returns a response, the upstream code routine gets the return result and resumes execution from where it yielded from in its uh, uh, um, in its code. So. We kind of know how asynchronous activity happens, but how do we handle uh, the results? How do I handle the result of a coroutine? What about callbacks? Well, uh, for this, you need to understand futures and tasks, which I'll try and explain in just two slides. Um, so a future, if you've done Twisted, this will all be very familiar to you. A future um, represents a result that may not yet be available yet. Uh, callback functions are added to a sort of a to-do list to be executed when the result is known. And a task is simply a future that wraps a coroutine. And the resulting object is realized um, uh, when the, uh, the coroutine completes. Uh, we say the future has resolved, which sounds all very doc too. Um, so here's some example code, which I hope makes this clear. So the first thing I do is I create a callback function, handle resolved task. Okay, and the only thing that it does is record, it, it, it logs the result. Uh, the next thing I do is I create a task associated with a certain coroutine that will, uh, that will pause um, 
And then I add to that task the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the callback that I defined above. Um, and the task object is automatically resolved when the coroutine that's associated with it completes. And at the end, I execute the code, because remember, uh, coroutines are generators, uh, by setting up and running the event loop itself, okay? So here's another perspective on this, a little bit mind-bending. So my buddy, Harry Jones, likes to point out that we're used to working with first-class functions in Python. We pass them in functions and we return them as values, okay? Um, Futures and tasks are a little bit like first-class function calls. Uh, we can also pass them into functions and return them as values. We just might not know what the result is yet, but we can start to add uh, callbacks to them. So let's do a quick recap before we uh, come to the sort of end of the talk. I see him waving the five-minute flag. Um, so an event loop is looping code that polls for I.O. and manages event handling callbacks. Uh, Coroutine is an object that represents activity that eventually completes or is a decorated function that returns such an object. The future represents a result that may not be available yet, and the associated callbacks are executed when it resolves. Like I said, the future resolves in a kind of mysterious Gallifreyan sort of a way. Um, and tasks are boilerplate future uh, classes that wrap coroutines, and these are realized when the coroutine completes. So, Given all this theory, let's very quickly uh, look at how async IO works in practice with my DHT project. Uh, for us to be able to do that, I need to very quickly explain how a DHT works. So, as I mentioned before, a DHT is made up of nodes, and the classic way to visualize this is with a clock face, uh, and you'll see why in a moment. Each node has a unique ID that is within a set of all possible values for a certain hashing function. Uh, you all know what hashing functions are because you were all in Holger's excellent talk this morning, okay? Um, and in my case, with my DHT, I use SHA-512. The ID's value indicates the node's position in the clock face, and in this way, we can tell where the node is located in the abstract network, as it were, uh, so we can tell who is close to whom and how far away nodes are from each other. So there is some sort of notion of distance in the DHT. And data is a key value pair. And uh, the key is turned into a hash, again, using the same hashing algorithm, SHA-512 in this case. And the value is stored at nodes whose IDs are close to the hash of the key. So uh, this is similar to understanding where to look things up in a multi-volume encyclopedia, going back to the example at the beginning. Um, articles are words, or keys in our case, and associated de definitions are values um, that are stored in volumes that cover some alphabetical range uh, within the global encyclopedia space, as it were. So aardvark belongs under A, whereas zebra belongs under Z. Okay? So how do nodes know where to look? Well, each node maintains something called a routing table that tracks the state of its peers. And each interaction with, uh, with its peers results in exchange of information about uh, the nodes that it's been talking to. Um, and that's how the routing table is populated initially and kept up to date, because nodes keep bumping into each other like ants in an ant's nest. Um, the routing table splits the clock face of nodes into buckets. Now, buckets contain the same number of peers, uh, but buckets cover a smaller range uh, closer to the local node they are. Therefore, the local node knows more closer nodes. As you can see, uh, me, I'm red at about half past one, um, and the nodes that I know are in the different buckets, and they are the blue squares. Okay? Each node... Um, has some very simple rules. They behave according to some very simple rules. It doesn't really matter what those rules are. I'm just putting a few up there to illustrate um, what I mean. Um, but the important thing about a hash table is that you need to be able to put values and you need to be able to get values. You need to get and set. And uh, each one of those fundamental actions requires a lookup, okay, um, so that you know which nodes you want to interact with. And all these interactions are asynchronous, and lookups are also parallel, concurrent, because you can ask several peers at the same time about the information that you need. So how does the lookup work? A recursive lookup is the six degrees of separation game, which always features Kevin Bacon if you're talking about Hollywood actors. So say I want to put a value with a key whose hash is in a position at six o'clock, okay? There's the target at six o'clock. And the first thing I do is I ask the nodes in my routing table that are closest to the hash. Um, and they reply with nodes from their routing table that are closer to the peers. 
and this keeps going um, recursively until I find nodes that um, I actually um, that, that are actually close to the target key. Until I can't find any nodes that are that are uh, close to the target key. So get and set requires a lookup. And how is this handled in the realm of async I/O? Well, a lookup is a future because it's something whose result we can't yet know until we finish looking up. We need to interrogate all our peers on the network. Okay. Um, and the state of the lookup, the progress in finding uh, nodes that are close to the target, is held within the lookup instance. And the lookup resolves, because it's a, it's a type of future, when the result is known. And the result is either going to be a value or not found exception in the case of a get operation, or it's going to be a list of the 20 closest known nodes in the DHT in the case of a put. And what I will do then is contact each of those 20 nodes and say, store this information for me, please. So what about networking? How does async IO handle different networking protocols? Um, how do nodes in the DHT handle the down the wire aspect of input output? So core concepts five, six, and seven are streams, transports, and protocols. Streams are high level abstractions that allow you to send and receive traffic down the network or from the network using reader and writer objects. Uh, transports are provided by async IO to handle low level networking. Uh, activities such as TCP and UDP, and they handle the low-level I/O layer and the buffering and the event loop sorts these out for you. So you shouldn't really have to interact with them. And protocols handle network protocols at the application layer. So, for example, HTTP or, or NetString, and so on and so forth. They're also a lot of fun. So streams are flows of data that can be read from or written to, and they are built upon the transports and protocols. So what is a transport? A transport is concerned about how stuff moves over the network. Whereas a protocol is uh, a protocol works out what to do with the stuff that arrives from the network. Um, it turns out it, it works out how to turn the raw bytes into something meaningful, uh, such as a net string message or an HTTP call. Um, and really, uh, you only need to work with uh, with streams and, and perhaps protocols if you're doing something a bit fun. So my final thoughts. Um, with my DHT, I, I've managed to get 100% unit test coverage, um, and this is because async IO is part of Python, and testing is, is normal. I'm using the built-in unit test library in Mock, um, and so how you organize your code is, is, is a key factor for this, but um, this is in contrast with, for example, Twisted, which has its own test runner, um, and its own um, unit test class doesn't work quite the same way as, as, the, uh, as the one in the standard library, which can be a bit confusing. Um, my DHT implementation is small and simple, so there are only 871 lines of code uh, as of this morning um, in the DHT itself. And this is because AsyncIO makes it easy, um, I've got about one minute, um, makes it easy to think about concurrent problems, okay? So uh, I believe uh, the abstractions make it easy to write very simple code that's short um, and comprehensible, okay? Um, and finally, I need to mention um, the difference between I.O. and CPU bound. Uh, don't use async I.O. if you need to do something with lots of CPU overhead, because of course that's going to block the event loop. Um, if you have lots of networking, however, that's the sweet spot. So the future, it all kind of changes for better in, in Python 3.5, coroutines with the async and await syntax, which Guido mentioned yesterday, his favorite feature, so it must be good. Um, so if you remember, here's the coroutine uh, that uh, I uh, showed you earlier on. Uh, simply all I've done is taken out the yield from and uh, put the correct keywords in for Python 3.5. Um, these are proper native coroutines, and they're not to be actually confused with generators, they work slightly differently. Uh, the new async syntax outside the code block defines the coroutine, uh, not some internal yield from, so it actually makes it easier to, to read, in my opinion. Um, and also the new features, uh, it comes with an await context manager and iteration protocols as well, so you can do some really cool things, although that's not shown here. Um, so PEP492 is Guido's favorite fe feature, go read that. Um, I've not tested this code, as I put, it's for illustrative purposes only. Um, that's it, finished. Guy in the yellow can smile. Uh, the DHT project is called the Drogulus, that's the GitHub account. Any questions? Yeah, does anybody that? have a short question? Yeah. A short question like my DHT code, that's short. No questions at all. Okay, thank you very much.